Okay. I've been talking real mad shit about some real shit movies the last couple of videos, and they're fun to make, but it's low-hanging fruit. As I continue this channel, I want to focus on the good and the bad. What separates film from other mediums? What pushes practice to innovation rather than stagnation? Why isn't there an Over the Hedge 2? When I think of some of my favorite films, I reflect on those that I had growing up. One being uh, Martin Scorsese's 1985 surreal dark comedy, After Hours. It was a film my dad may have shown me when I was a bit too young, but I mean, shit, it stuck with me. Maybe it stuck with you too. And if it didn't, maybe this video will help it stick. I'm talking serious in this one, so grab a blanket, get some extra marshmallows in your hot chalky, and get cozy, because I'm not going to shut the fuck up for a hot minute. I'm Andrew, I'm very caffeinated, and this is After Hours, the art of surreal comedy. We fell in love one summer night. I held you tight, you and I, under the moon. Now, I don't need to talk about Martin Scorsese literally at all. Everyone knows his work. But his 1985 film, After Hours, is one of his more brushed over films, and I think it deserves more recognition for what it was capable of achieving artistically. But first, let's talk about its conception. Coming out of 1982's The King of Comedy, Martin Scorsese began working on a film he considered a passion project for almost his entire life, The Last Temptation of Christ. Through 1983, Paramount became progressively more uneasy about the project, considering its continuously growing budget. The general departure from the gospel narrative also resulted in countless protests and letters from religious groups. The production was ultimately cancelled in 1983, leaving Martin Scorsese not only broken from losing this production, but also bitter and worried about the direction the film industry seemed to be going. He wanted to focus his time on smaller productions and independent companies. This was a very significant point in Scorsese's career for two reasons. He knew it true to himself that he had to bounce back and not let the failure of The Last Temptation reflect his continuing career, and two, he used this opportunity to challenge his ability to make a great film under artistic parameters reminiscent of when he was a film student. Meanwhile, Griffin Dunn and Amy Robinson stumble across a script entitled Lies, written by Columbia student Joseph Minion. After their independent group Double Play Company optioned the script, they began searching for funding and a director, and upon their viewing of a small Disney horror short entitled Vincent, they offered the director's chair to the young cartoonist Tim Burton. However, once Scorsese read the screenplay and conveyed his interest, uh, Tim Burton respectively withdrew himself from the project and took on Pee Wee's Big Adventure. Sorry, Tim. Something that was clear from the start of this production was Robinson, Dunn, and Scorsese were operating at the same caliber, capable of making a film fast and on a budget. With eight weeks of filming and for $8 million, they created something truly funny and insanely absurd, without compromising and with absolute artistry. Of all things I appreciate in what a film can accomplish, nothing really outweighs the feeling of absolute discomfort. For the same reasons I was absolutely enamored by Darren Aronofsky's 2017 Mother, After Hours confines you in an unfamiliar dreamscape that maintains anxiety and paranoia throughout. Not only that, but it still makes you laugh. I don't know what could have come over me. Lack of discipline. Possibly. A film taking place over the course of one night in a gritty 1980s New York City. We see this apparent split reality from the eyes of Paul Hackett, the yuppie protagonist experiencing a different version of New York through his own apparent nightmare cycle. It's clear at the beginning that Paul is not a night owl. After meeting Marcy at a coffee shop, bonding over Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer, he calls her and is invited over under unclear pretenses and is already wary of it being 11.30. The departure of his apartment at this time begins a frustrating and paranoid odyssey. Arriving at the Soho loft after all his money flies out of the cab, Paul is granted the keys. Very symbolically. He's not only accepting entrance into the loft, but the rest of the night. 
fairly reminiscent of the story of Sharon in Greek mythology, the ferryman who with proper payment takes you across the river, separating reality from the underworld. Paul not only loses his money, but he loses his sanity and control. He not only accepts the danger of the fallen keys, he accepts the danger of the night. While he attempts to consummate the sexual exploit he was expecting, it's learned that Marcy's entire life is up in the air and she's battling a lot of emotionally drowning problems. She invited Paul over regrettably, and when she breaks out as a neurotic person with traumas, issues, fears, and flaws, Paul loses interest. These are two people that have completely regretted the arrangement, but are trying to convince themselves that a sexual encounter is expected from them, and to push obvious red flags under the rug. We still don't really know Paul. We have no reason to side with him or have any agency with him or his choices. The only clear traits he seems to possess is unassuming and naive. With an impression of appearing civilized, there's still no evidence of him having any moral fiber. Having a weak heart when realizing she has severe burns on her body and growing an urge to leave the surreal atmosphere, we see Paul's presence and character completely change. What type of pot is this? It's Colombian. That's a lie. What? This isn't Colombian. I don't even think it's pot. That's what the guy who sold to me said it was. Well, the guy who sold it to you is a liar. So are you. That's shit. Don't get upset. I just won't buy it from him anymore. That's horse shit. Are you all right? Where are those plaster of Paris paperweights anyway? I mean, that's what I came down here for in the first place. Well, that's not entirely true. I came to see you. But where are the paperweights? That's what I want to see now. What's the matter? I said I want to see a plaster of Paris bagel and cream cheese paperweight. Now cough it up. Fine. <laughs> and thrust it into the cruel and absurd world he goes. Throughout the rest of the night, Paul's desperation to return home is countered by bad luck and advantageous people. Just about everyone he interacts with, specifically the women, all take his situation as a threshold to benefit themselves, hoping Paul will become a fixture in their lives, or to at least treat the situation like a blind date. Throughout the film, all conversations develop so absurd and displaced that the atmosphere becomes more and more that of a dream state. The dialogue comes off so entirely disconcerted because it is. From Paul's perspective and our own, an expectation of normalcy is met with being gaslit, not ever being validated or believed for what he has gone through. On and on, he crawls through the city, begging and submitting, questioning what he ever could have done to be caught in a sprawling nightmare where no one listens to you. Simply terrifying and justifiably rage-inducing. After Hours carries the weight of true human discomfort. Even with the comedic aspect of it, we're still only laughing at what is happening to Paul to comfort ourselves, to find humor in his shortcomings, grateful it is not us in this state. Up to the climax, as all whom he encounters rally a vigilante mob against him, falsely accusing him of repeated burglary, we ride the same waves of absurd paranoia as Paul does, only we get to laugh in his misery. In this scene, in which Paul is entering a diner for the second time this night, pressured to order, and chooses to order a meal, knowing he's about to leave, just to fuck with this guy for no reason. Then much later, him to find refuge in there, to hide from the mob, is served his cold meal. The referencing and connections of things in this world only channeled through Paul does nothing else than cause him paranoia, for these things certainly must be happening for a reason. What seems to be the only escape from this world we find ourselves in is the coming of sunrise. For Paul to never return home, never to find resolve, only to be propelled back to his reality from where he began is the ultimate punchline. 
While the themes of emasculation or the motif of undeserved grief resonate throughout and suck you into the world, nothing is as truly compelling and gripping as the style. With an absolute legend of a cinematographer, Michael Ballhaus, who would later become even more acclaimed for his work on Goodfellas and Bram Stoker's Dracula, matching Scorsese's focus on fast shooting, improvised movement, and challenging framing parameters, we're gifted an aesthetically visceral palette of gorgeous photography. The mood is painted into every frame. The movement and pacing is so meticulously crafted that even with more of a European filmmaking style at times, everything works, blends together, and forms perfect function. In terms of selling this surrealist fever dream, Michael Ballhaus deserved the nomination. With set design and lighting also being key factors in selling the frustrating surrealism of this world, nothing compares, in my opinion, to the score of this film. This being the only film Scorsese used an original score for besides Taxi Driver at the time, he took the opportunity to do it right, bringing in the heavyweight of film score composers, Howard Shore. You know, like the Lord of the Rings? Yeah, that pimp motherfucker. The four songs Howard Shore composed for the film are the driving force of this film's paranoia, while other music that appears in the film are relaxers, familiar and comforting, being played off the jukebox or in an apartment, warm, out of the rain, safe, I guess, except the Bad Brains playing at Club Berlin during Mohawk Night. But the score, the score is perfect because it frustrates you. It's anxiety inducing. You can try to not let it bother you, but you're still going to hear the ticking of the clock in every composition. Not only having so many absolute juggernauts on the crew, Scorsese's allowance of creative freedom with his actors allow the cast to do some really great things. Griffin Dunn was a producer first and actor second, but he still blossomed and gave a great performance because Scorsese was so encouraging of him being self-directed. Martin Scorsese is confident in his vision, allowing actors to bring whatever energy they think should be brought, and that allows artistry through collaboration. Behind the scenes of this uh, scene, uh, while doing an end slate, Griffin Dunn ran to a close by bar, ordered a round of drinks for the patrons and didn't pay, sprinted back into this scene just to sell the feeling of that fear a little bit more. With cast and crew working tirelessly and enthusiastically to complete the production, with Martin Scorsese grounding himself, going back to his roots, and challenging himself, we're left with the gem. A polished gem. A dark comedy excelling in all facets of standout filmmaking. Writing, cinematography, acting, sound design, even pacing, it's about harmony. And After Hours is harmonic. Its surrealism is palatable and stylistic in perfect union. While it's not one of Scorsese's films that gets routinely brought up on Film Bro Twitter or Our True Film or any other echo chamber of 20-something white dudes spinning fresh takes on Pulp Fiction, it's still adored by the majority of the people that have seen it, but more people should see it. Scorsese got to make The Last Temptation of Christ a few years later and continued on to carve the marble of his career into the behemoth of a sculpture it is today and After Hours played a fundamental role in that. I haven't seen The Irishman yet, but at this rate, maybe I'll talk about it in 30 years. In the meantime, be a good person, and if someone invites you to a loft in Soho, just say no. Thank you if you got this far, I appreciate your attention. Subscribe if you want more, and unsubscribe if you want less. Thank you, and good night.